The Monster Guys Podcast begins now. Welcome to the Monster Guys Podcast. My name is DC McGannon. As always, I'm here with my partner and co-conspirator in all things creative, C. Michael McGannon. How you doing, Michael? Good. Uh, good as always. Awesome. You know, we recently had a chance to sit down and speak with Zach Davison and interview him about his works with various publications about yokai, his time in Japan. And let me tell you something. The interview that you're about to hear that we did a few weeks ago is is chock full of content and a really interesting conversation. It is. Um, I think you had spoken with Zach on a more personal level than I had. I had only sent maybe one or two emails back and forth with him. And I, I really didn't know about any of the projects he had worked on um, up until that night. But he was really fun to talk to and super knowledgeable. I mean, he lived in Japan for seven years, so he, he definitely knows quite a lot about the subject matter and really blew me away with just how fun and energetic the conversation was. It really was an energetic conversation. Zach is the author of Yurei, The Japanese Ghost, his book available on Amazon.com. He's also a writer and contributor with the Wayward series by Image Comics. And really, to be honest with you, and you'll hear it in the interview, uh, I say it, I think, once or twice, that the list of projects that he has worked on or is working on is just exhaustive. There's no way we could have listed it all here. Uh, He's also the translator for Kitaro, and uh, we talk quite a bit about those projects and other projects and his uh, love of yokai and Japanese culture. really is a lot of depth and really cool information uh, about those topics that we'll get into with him. Definitely, and as somebody with an ever-growing reading list, my my reading list jumped a few notches, and I'm going to have to find even more space and time to sit down and read projects that I'm really excited to see come out from him now. Most certainly, my reading list grew as well, but a lot of his material just jumped to the top of that reading list pretty fast. Yeah. So we're very excited to present to you an interview with Zach Davison, um, writer, folklorist, and just all around energetic and very nice guy. So we don't want to take up too much more time here. Uh, We do want to remind you of our new Yokai podcasts that we're doing weekly, short stories with short and interesting conversation about specific Yokai. A lot of those stories are original stories that we write or classic folk tales that we bring out of the history books and just have a good conversation about yokai. Those are ongoing weekly as we continue our month-long discussion of yokai and Japanese culture. So let's switch over now to that conversation with Zach and just get ready. Take notes, whatever you got to do. And as always, the information that we present about Zach and where to contact him and his works uh, will be available in the show notes. So here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the Monster Guys interview with Zach Davison. Zach Davison, ladies and gentlemen. Zach, it's great to have you. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for inviting me on. I'm I'm pretty excited to talk to you guys. Very cool. All month long, we have been talking about yokai and Japanese culture on the Monster Guys podcast. It's a real honor and a pleasure to have the opportunity to chat with you tonight. What can you tell us about yourself? If you can just spill the beans about you, go for it. (laughs) So I'm a writer and a translator, and I've been working with Japanese folklore for quite some time. I actually, I did my master's degree and I did my master's thesis on, on Yurei, on Japanese ghosts, uh, which I later turned into a book. And I'm also the translator on for Shigeru Mizuki, who is probably Japan's, well, uh, I used to be able to 
to say greatest living folklorist, but he unfortunately passed away um, just a couple of months ago. But he's definitely the person most responsible for you or anyone else to even be having a conversation about yokai. I mean, his comic book, Kitaro, really is what established what they call the um, the Showa yokai boom that, that brought yokai to pop culture, where um, basically out of folklore and into pop culture, which is the only reason why we're really talking about it today, um, how we all even know about it. So I'm his translator as well, which is which is a great honor and a privilege. I love working on his stuff. So I run a website called Chaku Monogatari, and I've been working, I've had that since about 2010. So And just for our listeners, we are going to post all the links where you can find Zach's work and uh, books and all that kind of stuff. So if you're not catching a website domain or a name, we're going to list that in our show notes and have that available on the monsterguys.com. Going back, just a point of interest for me because Michael and I have studied martial arts for many years together Mm -hmm. and you know there's a great deal of honor and reverence for those who are your teacher your mentor those who you work for Mm -hmm. Do do you have a similar relationship in this type of setting with writing and with translation with somebody as esteemed as he was how how does that relationship work oh yeah I mean I mean Mizuki is you know he's my sensei you know he's my well was I mean my absolute hero but he is as esteemed as a person could be in Japan. I mean, really, he was given the um, the title of a person of cultural merit, which is a title bestowed upon someone for their profound impact on the national culture. So when you're talking about him, I mean, it's really hard to explain to a Western audience exactly how esteemed he was. It, like I say, people like, oh, he's kind of like, like imagine if Walt Disney and Howard Zinn and, you know, were, were sort of wrapped into the same person. Because not only is he a great preeminent folklorist and cartoonist as well, but he also fought in World War II. Um, he lost his arm fighting on the Isle of Rabul, and he turned all of his, his stories into war memorials. So he's, he's just someone that's had a profound impact on the culture. And working with him was, you know, was one of the great honors of my life. I'm really, really proud that I got to have that contact with him and be able to work with him while he was still alive. No doubt. What, what a privilege. And uh, I, I'm sure we could probably talk for days just listening to stories and insights that you might have gained from working with somebody like that. So what a what a privilege and what an honor. Oh, uh, yeah, you. absolutely. Like, you know, it's rare to find somebody of that stature yes. and character and that influence in our world today. Regards to you on his passing and, and to his family, a great loss, I'm sure, for you and, and for the country of Japan and the world. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, I mean, he was not nine- Three years old, so it, sometimes it's hard to say that. And as he himself said, you know, he really should have died in World War II, so it was borrowed time every year after that. Um, but yeah, it was it was amazing working with him. He was a, a national, international treasure, and it was um, amazing that I had the opportunity that that the West had never really discovered him before. Then I actually spent years trying to get company, like any company, interested in translating his work, but there was no real interest in it, and there was no, I mean, because you know nobody knew what a yokai was, and so when you you're saying, hey, I want to bring over this yokai manga or this guy that's really interested in yokai. First, you have to lay the groundwork of teaching them what that even means. Right. How did you get into that part of the uh, the culture? Did you spend time in Japan or were you were you just interested in J- Japanese culture? Yeah, I lived in Japan for about seven years. And, you know, I've just, I think like a lot of people, I've just was, I don't know, born with some sort of natural interest in monsters and the supernatural. I mean, growing up in the Pacific Northwest, I was really interested in Bigfoot. I, you know, I lived in Scotland for a while and I went, you know, Loch Ness Monster hunting and it was just all of these. I've always been really interested in in folklore and in supernatural monsters. That sort of boundary between fiction and nonfiction of these of these monsters that, you know, were considered real at some point in time. And there's just, I don't know, there's a great interesting mystery around it. No, I mean, we can definitely understand that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you are the monster guys, right? So. <laughs> and then when I moved to Japan... It was like hitting the mother load. It was like, you know, this is the the most monster country on earth. I can't think of any country that loves their monsters as much as Japan does. No, I can definitely, I, that may be my, my attraction to it. I've always loved reading about 
Japanese mythology and folklore, just the the bizarre uh, monsters that they have. Well, and it's amazing when you get there, when you see how much part of the living culture it is, that it's not something that is just found in books or comics, but this monster lore is really a part of the everyday in Japan. Yeah, it, it seems as though the people of Japan really interact with these creatures on, on many different levels. Like you said, it's not just something you find in books. It's woven into the very fabric of their lives, their storytelling, their city squares. I mean, it seems in just our our research and, and some of the writing that we've done on this topic and the speaking we've done, it seems like this is as close as you get in a culture to their mythology and their folklore and their monsters. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I remember when my when my mother came over to visit me in Japan. She one of her comments, which I thought was quite um, interesting for her to notice, was just that you know there's gods and monsters everywhere. You walk down the street and there's little shrines here, and all the sushi shops have an oni or a kappa or something like that, you know, it's really just a vital living part of the culture, which if you're interested well, in folklore is, a, is just so enjoyable to be inside of. Well, even in the language I've noticed and some of the concepts that they have about um, you know, other people, you know, I, I remember reading a lot of, uh, reading up on a lot of monsters as a, as a kid or a teenager and so many of their phrases, like their day-to-day idioms are based on this monster or a kitsune or an oni. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the way you describe someone um, like for example someone who's duck up you you call them a tengu which is that's awesome yeah that, i mean that integrated it is clearly that, integrated that is fascinating and and maybe you touched on this a, a couple of minutes ago but can you kind of refresh for us how did you get into this uh course of life and work what what prompted this and and how did you how did you get there and and doing what you're doing right now you know it's been i don't know it's been a, a long and interesting journey and i think think that that you get there by just doing it. I mean, there's really there's no invitation into doing it and it's a fairly uphill battle and you only really get there by just making the decision that you know, I'm going to I'm going to do the work. Is kind of the the uh, man- mantra I guess that a lot of us that are in this profession say is, you know, how do you do it? You do it by doing it. And then eventually you do it long enough that you get paid to do it. So somebody pays attention. Yeah, <laughs> and you kind of have to force you. I mean, like when I, like when it came to knocking on Kitaro, you know, it was just or to doing Shigeru Mizuki's works. It was just me. It was sheer willpower. You know, it was knocking on a lot of doors and getting turned down. I mean, for my book, Yure, that I got published, you know, I probably got turned down by a hundred different publishers and agents and everything before I find one, found one that said yes. So yeah. being, being stubborn well, is a really useful skill, as well as, you know, setting a goal and driving to it. Yeah, you really do have to sink your teeth in and do what you love mm-hmm. and, and let no one take that from you. So I, I appreciate appreciate that about you and I, I feel like just reading some of your material the last week I feel like you probably learned that valuable lesson from your own sensei from your own mentor oh absolutely yeah and actually one of the greatest things that I you know I was really inspirational to me from Mizuki was finding out that he published his first comic when he was 40 really? yeah right wow. so this is someone who you know and you when you read something like that you're like wow this is someone that's had this profound impact and essentially failed all their life you know, I hate to say it's failure, but he certainly wasn't succeeding, you know, until he, he had his, you know, published his first comic. That wasn't even his hit, you know, that was his first, you know, just publication. Right. But that character has been a huge part of the culture um, ever since then, if I remember correctly. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And you're talking about Kitaro yes. right now. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, you mentioned just a moment ago about your book that you had published. And if I'm not mistaken, the list of publications that you have either written or collaborated on or tried translated is a mile long. Yeah, I've done I've worked on a lot of things. Um, like even your your previous guest uh, Matthew Meyer actually edited um, his book when they came out. So I was trying to compile a list and say, well, here's all of Zach's books, but it just kind of kept going. And it keeps uh, going. I've got a lot, you know, I always have constant stuff that I'm working on. I I hope, you know, cuz one of the things about getting successful is it breeds more success. So the more the more good work you do, the more you get, and I'm hoping that it never ends. Hopefully my my list of books will never finish. Absolutely, and, and kudos to you. So let's talk about that just for a moment. Uh, I want to give you an opportunity to share with mm-hmm. us and our listeners. I know just from the past few days, looking into your materials, like I said, one of your prominent books that you have at top of market right now is Yurei, mm-hmm. the Japanese Ghost. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Okay, and then I know you also translate for Kitaro and 
you write for Wayward, yeah. the image comes release. So can you just take us, and maybe you have some others that you want to mention, uh, but maybe let's start with Yure, the Japanese Ghost, your book that is available on Amazon.com. Tell us a little bit about that, why you wrote that, and if there's any other places you prefer people to find that. No, actually, I mean, I'm, I'm happy for people to find the book wherever they find it. It really doesn't bother me where people where people get it, but I really love it when they read it. So, um, it, and, and let me know about it. Like, every time someone writes me a letter telling me that they enjoyed my book, it just thrills me. So that, that book, I think like a lot of people who write a book, it was essentially the book I wanted to read because I was really fascinated by Yure. Um, and I was really fascinated. So when I was really young, I mean, this was elementary school, maybe third or fourth grade, my mother had bought me this series of books that was called Time Life, the Enchanted World. And basically a book would come every month. It was back when you used to subscribe to books. And like a book would come every month and it was all of these different folkloric monsters. So like there was like a book on dwarves and there was a book on dragons and a book on elves. And there was one book on ghosts. And when I was reading the book, they had this story in there called The Wife's Revenge, which I now know is the story of Oiwa, uh, but I didn't know it at the time. But it was it was all about this, this Japanese ghost story. And I was just fascinated with it as a kid because she looked so completely different from what I thought ghosts looked like. You know, it was so completely different from my standard template of a ghost. And then later on, when I saw, you know, some of the J-horror movies that came out, you know, much later, like I saw Ring and I saw The Grudge, and there was just something that clicked in my mind where I'm like, that is the same character, right? That ghost woman coming out of the TV there is the same as this person that haunted me when I was a little kid. And I would just, I wanted to know what the connection was there. But there was almost nothing written about it in English. And so I knew if I wanted to make that connection, I was going to have to master the language and basically figure it out for myself. So um, I did that as my uh, as my master's degree. I wrote my master's thesis on you today. Then when I was done with that, you know, I, I thought it was fascinating. I thought that maybe other people might be interested in it as well. So I went through the process of turning a rather dull master's thesis into what I think is a more interesting book. And that was, I mean, that was a really long process, but yeah. Well, that that's very cool. Uh, just for the sake of definition, can you, and we'll go back to your works here in just a moment briefly, but can you define for us your what what does that mean? What does that look like apart from just a couple of the pop culture mm -hmm. movies that the West is familiar with? What is so, Yure? In my book, I try to make the argument that Yure is a distinct supernatural creature and kind of deserving of their own title. I make the comparison to like leprechauns or banshee or other supernatural creatures that have kind of, you know, they, we, we know their names. At some point in time, it must have been weird for someone to say the word leprechaun or vampire or something like that, but we we've become used to them as terms and the same with yokai now you know i think that it's a sort of unique supernatural you know unique folkloric character different from other ghosts and i think one of the things that separates yure not only from a sort of like cultural perspective because it's so deeply ingrained in japan in japanese history is this idea of when you die on the moment of your death whatever you want gets imprinted on your spirit so the perfect person dies wanting nothing but if if you die wanting something, that desire, if it's strong enough, can create this specter called a yure. And this yure is basically this creature of whatever this last desire is. So if the yure is angry, it rains down, you know, terror on you. If the yure is lonely, it goes in search of a, of a lover or a companion. Um, there's all sorts of stories, like there's a story of a woman who had a servant just pop up one day, you know, she died, and her ghost popped up and said, thank you, and then disappeared. And the realization was that on her deathbed, she realized that she had forgot to thank her um, her mistress. So whatever is that final key desire, that is what drives and powers the yure. And as soon as that desire is met, then they vanish from Earth. It's very different from the Western ghost style of like, like some people describe Western ghosts as like a looped tape reel or something that just sort of haunts aimlessly. Yure very definitely have an aim. And they must have that because without that aim, without that purpose, they can't actually exist. That's very interesting and it, it sets some things straight for me because I know a lot of there are a lot of categories to yure um, or a lot of distinct types 
And it's funny to me when I when I read up on certain types of urea, they share the same name, but they they have such a variance in what they are known for. Yeah. So one type a do this or do that, where it may come back just to say thanks to a lover, or it may come back to drag a family member to help. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that actually clears up a lot. That, that clicks into place. Yeah, they're often subcategorized, sort of like by what their what's their desire. You know, what's driving them. Like like the onyo is the most famous one because that's the urea with a mm-hmm. what they call a grudge bearing spirit so that's something that wants revenge and the most terrifying of the grudge bearing spirits are the ones who are just kind of angry at fate or angry at life or something like that because it's hard to appease them um, if they if they're just angry at a certain person then they can kill the person and be done with it and then they they go away and disappear and yurei are also um, traditionally in Japanese culture they're the wielders of earthquake and fire and typhoon so natural disasters were always attributed to angry ghosts and still often are. I mean, even when you have you know, the current typhoon or Fukushima, I mean, a lot of times they'll look for some sort of supernatural source for that. You know, was there someone who was done wrong that reigned there? You know, this was the manifestation of their rage. That's really interesting. We just finished recording a segment about Oni and the Tengu. Mm-hmm. It, it, similar thoughts there, uh, especially with, with the Oni, how they were originally thought to be the storms, the typhoons, the earthquakes mm-hmm. and you're saying the same thing uh, about the yeah year. and oni i mean oni are also i mean all of these creatures originally spring from the same source i mean if you go back far enough into japanese mythology you have the spirits of the of the restless dead i mean that's really like the early like even the kami and all of that you know like really really ancient ancient japan that's all you had and they only started like actually it was really contact with china that sort of brought this diversification i guess of pantheon of spirits where you had like the Oni are clearly the Rakshasa from Hindu mythology I mean you just have to look at a picture of one and a picture of the other and ask right. why is a why is an Oni wearing a tiger skin when there's no tigers in Japan well you know where there's tigers there's tigers in India because that's an Indian monster you know so um, right. you know contact with other cultures started to kind of diversify Japan's supernatural portfolio that is to say um, but Oni were and you they were originally the same thing in fact I believe yeah the kanji for Oni actually is the Chinese character for ghost. Okay, which we just, uh, with that episode that we just did, actually, that makes sense as well because I know Oni, like we said last time, is a bit of a blanket term or was a blanket term for some time. Absolutely. And there's all sorts of theories of the Oni and where it came from. And like, you know, how did that manifestation come from, you know, we have this idea of these angry spirits and then all of a sudden you have Oni and then, you know, Buddhism came in and they sort of took the Oni and put them to work as demons in hell, which they never were before the advent of Buddhism. And yeah, it's a pretty interesting topic, Oni. Michael and I talk a lot about monsters from around the world, and we're always interested in how one culture influences another culture or how we have similarities or differences among monsters that uh, may or may not be the same Mm -hmm. creature. In a kind of a broad, sweeping consideration, why do you feel that yokai are so unique in the world of folklore and mythology around the world? You know, and when you hit me up with this, so people who study yokai... one of the things that we'll never agree on is what does the word mean? Yeah, we kind of yeah. get that. If you get 10 <laughs> folklorists in a room, you'll get 10 different definitions for yokai. <laughs> so I use yokai uh, the way Shigeru Mizuki used it because he's he's my mentor in these things. And he used it as a general term for all supernatural. So to Mizuki Shigeru, the Loch Ness Monster was a yokai. Bigfoot is a yokai. He would have just called that an American yokai or a Scotland yokai. So if you want to ask me what's unique about Japanese, Japanese yokai, then I can say, okay, Japanese yokai, what I think is really different about them is I think what's similar about the culture of Japan itself, which is that as a culture, it's really good at adopting and assimilating from other cultures. Japan can absorb everything and lose nothing in the same way that it's had like a lot of, you know, you you can have a Japanese person that is both Shinto, Buddhist, and Christian all at the same time and see absolutely no conflict there or any contradiction. They have this amazing ability to just absorb and not replace. Like most religious societies and most folkloric and monster societies go through a gradual staging of processes where one replaces the other.
together. Whereas I think Japan, you gain more, but it never actually replaces the old. The old continues to exist alongside the new. And so you keep adding without subtracting anything, which leads you with a massive pantheon of monsters far beyond any other societies who's gone through a period of, of rejecting the old in favor of the new. You know, I mean, if you think of it like, because I also like comic books, right? So when you think of it like a superhero universe or something, you know, eventually they start to retire old characters in favor of the popular ones. But Japan doesn't retire the old characters. They keep everyone. That's fascinating. And, and, and you're right. I mean, it seems like an endless number of monsters within Japanese mythology and folklore. Like, we could just go on forever and never find the end sure. of yokai. And you could really see that even in their, their anime and their manga where you have these very old characters right up against the, the modern characters and they, they both seem to fit right in place. You don't really question why you have this old sandal right next to this you know uh, new motorcycle. Totally, monster. because it's limited only by the imagination. Like, Rishigeru Mizuki himself, I mean, he created tons of new yokai, uh, probably as many as Toriyama did himself, who's sort of the original creator of yokai. And now Mizuki's yokais are so well accepted that a lot of people assume that they have these ancient folkloric roots. Well, they don't. He made them up because that's part of the tradition of yokai is is making up new ones to go along with the old ones. <laughs> that's absolutely wonderful. I love that, and it gives me uh, it gives me hope and a little bit of confidence that perhaps we could go make our own yokai and add to the legend and the tradition. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. One one thing that I I notice in anybody who pays attention to anything will notice is that Japanese culture has a great influence in almost every other culture throughout the world. It's uh, it's mysterious, it's fascinating, it's deep, and at the same time, it's fun and whimsical, and yokai fits that culture so well. One of the things that I see happening is that the popularity of yokai is on the rise around the world, and especially in the West. You know, and I, I don't know, maybe it began with Pokemon, Maybe it began before that, but I definitely see the term yokai being used a lot more these days. How influent, if you could look ahead, you know, two, three, five years from now, how influential do you believe yokai in the world of Japanese folklore is going to be in just a couple of years? What, what, where do you see that going? Yeah, it's such an interesting question because honestly, I don't know. It's, and you're right. I mean, it, it is... In the time that I've been doing this, like when I started doing yokai research, and I was one of the first ones to actually do anything, especially on the internet. I mean, back in, you know, 2010 when I started my blog, there was really almost nothing out there. Um, there were certainly no books written, and nobody knew the word yokai. And, like, I do a lot of panels at conventions and things like that because I really like going to conventions and doing panels on this subject. And I used to always have to define the term. And I noticed that nowadays I don't have to anymore. It's become part of the vernacular in the same way that if you look at old books, you know, stuff like from the, the 1800s, they used, to, uh, they used to translate the word samurai as knight because nobody knew what the word samurai meant. And eventually there was a shift. And so now everyone just leaves samurai as samurai. Now everyone knows what yokai is, which is awesome. And it's funny because yeah. one of the battles that I had to fight when I was translating Kitaro was was leaving those words in there, was saying, no, let's just make this yokai, you know, let's put it in there, you know, and just leave it. And I'm really glad that I was able to convince everyone that that was the right way to go because history sort of caught up, or I guess not history, but culture sort of caught up with where um, where we were hoping to go. So, you know, I'm hoping that there'll be more of that. I keep hoping that Yokai Watch will catch on or, you know, I mean, I actually did, a, I did an article, I was interviewed for an article in the New York Times last year where they were mentioning how, you know, the sort of same thing how there seems to be this yokai boom going in a lot of books being published on the subject and so i hope it just keeps going i think that I think that would really be a kicker is if there was a nice yokai movie. I mean, the, the West seems to be fairly movie-driven or TV show-driven more than anything else. You know, it's like the vanguard comes in with comic books and maybe nonfiction books, and eventually if you hit a movie or something like that. I mean, there was the Keanu Reeves movie, but I never saw it, and I heard it wasn't very good, so... Yeah, we actually just spoke of that in our segment on the Tengu, because... 
it was it was a box office mm-hmm. flop. You you ask anybody, and and most people would tell you it's one of the greatest losses in in cinema. Uh, however, the scene at the Tengu mm-hmm. Temple, in my opinion, was stunning. I, I think if nothing else, look up the movie and just watch that scene alone, apart from the rest of the movie, because I really enjoyed how they depicted the mm-hmm. Tengu and the interaction with the humans and everything that took place there. The rest of the movie aside, who knows? <laughs> I, I was I, I, I was excited. It. I mean, it, it was. I think the movie was pretty decent. I don't think it was given as much credit as it probably uh-huh. should have. That one scene in the Tengu forest and in their temple, to me, I was happy just to see that uh-huh. scene. All right, I'll have to I'll have to watch it and just try to check out that one scene then. Uh-huh. Yeah, and and then you might call me back and say you're dumb, <laughs> you're wrong, you you don't know what you're talking about. It wasn't <laughs> the most perfect movie yeah. ever made, but I think I think some movies that have been highly uh-huh. Celebrated weren't as good. So I mean, it, it it was still a fun movie, and there were quite a few elements that anybody that was a fan of yokai or kitsune or tengu would pick up on and enjoy. If not, yeah, and and it was a mainstream yokai movie. I mean, which is pretty groundbreaking in and of itself. You know, and yeah. that's like that's... like doing wayward for image. It's really amazing to me that I'm working on an American yokai comic. I am pretty excited to see that. I had not seen that yet, but DC pointed it out to me when we started talking about doing an interview with you and I, I started I haven't finished the entire first volume yet but I started flipping through that first volume and was very excited to see things that I, I could recognize and pick up oh, on oh yeah it's remarkably well done and in fact when I when I first got contacted about that series it's so funny now because I was so dubious at the time right when I first got put in contact and you know just sort of through a networking thing someone's like oh you know Jim Sub he's doing this comic set in Japan and I was just like, oh, God, it's going to be another one done so poorly. <laughs> and my first email response to Jim was so terse. It was just like, yeah, yeah, fine, you know, whatever. I'll look at your script, whatever, you know. <laughs> and then I saw it, and I was just like, he had only sort of wanted me to come on for some advice, but I immediately just hired myself on for the duration. I'm like, no, this is this is something really unique and amazing here, and I'm going to be a part of this, whether you like it or not. Well, when you when you told me about it, I was, I'm not a big comic mm-hmm. guy. I, I like like comics, I've enjoyed them, but I've never been a huge collector of comics. And in the last couple of years, I've really gotten into a lot of comics that Image has mm-hmm. put out. I, I collect a few series in full of some Image comic series. So when you you said first of all it was Image, I got excited. Then you said it was about yokai. I was just like done and done, and I went straight to our local comic book store. I mean, literally, <laughs> I, I was probably messaging you on the way out the door and I went straight to that store and found the series and I picked it up and I started reading it and I was just so pleasantly surprised like you said that it was so yep. well done and it's worth reading you know furthermore that it's about yokai in the west you know the west has a chance to get their hands on yokai through this very popular and quality medium yeah I think as I recall it was one night asking DC asking hey do you want to interview Zach Davison and then the next night he was like hey Hey, have you heard of this comic? And I turn around and there it is in the same. <laughs> and um, just also, just to let you know, so I uh, the trade paperback does not have the essays I write because the essays are mostly collected just in the single issues. So I actually it has some of the yokai files that I wrote, but it doesn't have. I do like these monthly cultural essays on yokai or just dif- different aspects of Japan. So that's one of our way to okay. try and get people to read the single you know monthly issues is they have a little bit extra in them. Yeah, definitely. That's pretty cool that that is reminiscent of some manga series that i enjoy mm-hmm. following yeah and i love doing that sort of stuff like with the new series like well the first volume of kitado i got to do some ma- yokai files and like i'm all about the bonus features so with the new series coming we're doing even more bonus features very cool i i definitely have the first series and i've put on order the individual issues so i'll be looking forward to that cool. while, while we're talking about wayward if i'm reading it correctly i and i haven't got very far in into the series, but I do see some creative license when it comes to yokai. The story, obviously, is a very cool setting.
Wayne, what can you tell us about the series itself? We know that you're working on it and you're working uh, with some of the files in it. But what can you tell us about the series itself? Because I would love for people to get their hands on this and support this medium with regards to yoga. So the series itself is really, it's really a classical and it's, you know, it's a story that's been told multiple times, which is the idea of gods are not the, the you know, if you, if you think of gods, right, if you think of a supernatural creature, there's sort of the conundrum of who creates who. Did God create humanity or does humanity create gods? And there's an old style of storytelling where you have the idea that humanity creates gods and that gods and monsters require belief in order to retain power. And that as beliefs mm-hmm. shift, old powers fade and new gods arise. And that's sort of the idea of wayward, which is that you have Japan culturally shifting. And as it shifts away from new objects of worship, the older yokai are, you have some that are able to adapt and sort of integrate themselves into the modern pantheon. And then you have some who are going to, they're not willing to give up their throne. And so they're fighting to retain their power. And then you have these sort of, you know, new elements, which are the new players on the field which are arising as belief shift who may not even be necessarily aware of their new status and trying to struggle for preeminence and what does that mean to a culture when they shift gods you know what happens to the old rules and the old society when they make a an unthroning of the old gods you know and that is such a classic story i mean i probably heard this story for the first time reading my old copy of delary's book of greek myths when the gods unseated the titan yeah, i think Amer- neil gaiman's american gods come yep, to mind absolutely and that's yep. really good love that yep. type of story that's another one and neil gaiman i mean he's been he's been doing this since his old comic series the sandman i mean that was the first time i really read a story about you know new gods you know arising and usurping the their old gods and um yeah so it's a it's it is one of those classic themes and that's kind of what wayward is is you have that sort of classic theme but it's done in what i think is a really interesting way and i don't want to give too much of the story away it does have you know it has creative license with the yokai obviously uh because that's the way you're supposed to do it folklore is meant to change and adapt with the time and not simply be put under a glass dome and preserved and studied right i mean each artist that touches it should do something unique to make it different which i really like about the series i'm really glad you said that i do believe that art needs to push boundaries even in folklore and mythology you know i think sometimes we need to take off the white gloves (laughs) and have some fun with it philip pullman did a translation of the grimm's fairy tales and in his introduction he says this great quote that i use all the time to people where he says that anyone who writes a fairy tale and doesn't change it just a little has misunderstood the purpose of a fairy tale. Yeah. That's perfect. I guess that answers my question ahead of time. Then I was going to ask you, working on that comic, because I, when I look through Wayward, I saw yokai that I recognized and loved, and I saw differences mm-hmm. there that were at once something that I was a bit cautious of, and at the same time something that I got a little bit of excitement with. And uh, just for instance, the the River Monster of the Kappa, I, I the first thing that popped into my mind, and this is not in a bad way, this mm-hmm. is not in a way that's comical or anything, but I was thinking Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Right, totally, yeah. And again, it's not in a bad way. I think in one of the pages, they actually, like, bite a person clean in half, so it was the very dark mm-hmm. version. But it, it, I did want to ask you what you thought about yokai being changed, just altered as it goes from culture Well, and culture. I had to go, like, with Wayward, I had to go through the same process, because when I first got the script, you know, one of my feedback was like, well, you're doing Kappa wrong. You know, they're, they don't do this, they aren't like this. And, you know, it was sort of this discussion discussion. It was like, well, they are in our universe because we're making our own thing. And like in the first issue, I actually had them add a line where uh, one of the characters, Ayane, says, you know, I liked you better when you had the little bowls on your head. To me, that was a way of saying, I wanted I wanted people to know that we weren't just making mistakes, that it was a conscious choice to change the kappa, you know, that we knew what kappa were, but we just want to do this kind, you know. So we added that little bit of dialogue there to sort of clarify that. And I think that that's fine. You know, like another, probably my favorite 
favorite living comic artist and probably my favorite living artist now that Shigeru Mizuki has passed is Mike Mignola, who does the comic series Hellboy. I, you know, I speak with him uh, whenever he comes or whenever I'm at the same convention with him. I mean, he's just he's just a fascinating person. And he is very much not beholden to any particular folklore. He will take what he wants from it and he'll change how he likes. And he's more concerned about it suiting the needs of his story than he is about trying to, you know, present an education on something that happened. But it's always, he always knows it really well. And so every change he makes is a conscious choice. And to me, I think that's important. That's the important part of Wayward, too, is like, we don't make any changes because we just got it wrong. You know, we never messed up or read the wrong book or something like that. It was always like, okay, here's what we know. And now let's choose to make these changes. So I I think you would agree with me. As I look on, I just sent Michael some pictures Mm -hmm. last night. I was in a store and I see yokai watch displays here and there, and I've seen them over the past couple of weeks. One of the things I told him a couple of weeks ago was that they're not educating the American consumer, and right now it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And and, and I even saw yokai watch Monopoly last night already oh, on the yeah, shelves. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I see a lot of this coming to our retail, and of course we've got it in manga, we've got it in anime, we've got it in, in cartoons and all kinds of stuff. So I... I think you might agree with me that instead of trying to be elitist or purists, let's just have fun with this and along the way, just kind of like with the Pokemon mm-hmm. craze, people will figure it out. But let's just have fun with it and enjoy the story as totally. it unfolds. I love Yokai Watch. You know, I've watched. I can sing the song. I think it's a it's a great show. You know. <laughs> Could you do that for us? Could you do that for us right yoka. now? Yokai. I only know <laughs> the Japanese version though. Yo, Yokai, Yokai, Yokai Watchichi. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. All right, yeah. yes. I, uh, I kind of put <laughs> no, you on the spot I'm, I'm there. Because I'm totally the same way. Like, I think, you know, like, I've heard people are like, they get they get upset with Yokai Watch, or, you know, they're like, oh, it's just copying Pokemon, or even stuff like that. I'm like, ultimately, who cares? If it's, if it's fun and people right. have a good time with it, I mean, is it is it real Yokai? No, but you know what there is nothing of? There are no real Yokai. <laughs> right. I remember when DC first pointed it out to me, and that for me, it's still fairly recent. In fact, when he sent me the picture of the Yokai Watch Monopoly, I was like, already? I mean, I haven't even seen yeah. the story yet, but I remember going up to Barnes Noble and looking at him and trying to see what Yokai comes from where, and I remember seeing a bunch of uh, Baki Neko and Nekomata mm-hmm. with fireballs in their eyes, and I was like, where's the where's the different Yokai? Yeah. So I have to remind myself just to have fun with it and see what they because- because Yokai Watch, I mean, and they even like, like it's, well, and that's the funny part too, because now I get a bunch of people who see Yokai Watch, and they'll assume that that is the folkloric aspect of Yokai. And so, you know, it's all, like you said, it's always funny when people say things so definitively, and they'll walk up and they're like, well, yes, Yokai are these invisible spirits that cause different <laughs> emotions. You know, that's what they are. <laughs> and I'm like, well, Mm, yes, and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and, and you, you kind of have to uh, ask the question. So your experience with this creature yeah, is? <laughs> like, well, they, they say that. I'm like, oh, yeah, I like Yokai Watch, too. But, uh, you know, actually it has a much yeah. And, you know, and that's and nobody nobody really learns everything from a know-it-all, you know, telling them, oh, you're wrong. You know, you're just watching the pop culture <laughs> version. You're just completely destroying our convention panels, Zach, because we're all about education and telling everybody what's right and what they should think about yokai. I'm I, you know, I love like I love the education portion too. Obviously, I mean that's what I do. I mean, I go to colleges and teach about this stuff. I just did a I just taught in elementary school as well. But I think that you can I think that you can have it all. You know, I think you can have Godzilla and think that that's awesome. And I think that you can also know the folkloric roots of a yure and think that that's awesome. And I think that, like, for me, one of the parts that I love so much, I love doing the detective work. I love putting together all of the story that goes behind it, you know, the long tail and figuring out the point A to point B. But at the end of the day, no point along the line is better than any other point, you know? Right. There's no point that's more real or more valid because at some point in time, it all was the new version. Yeah, it's it's storytelling. It, I mean, it's the art and the essence and the the magnificence of storytelling. Mm-hmm. 
So going back to the dis- specific discussion of yokai, could you, and I may be able to guess this already, but could you pull out a favorite yokai for us or a, or a couple? <laughs> what what are your yeah, favorite I, in the thousands and thousands yeah. of them out there? I mean, my favorite are the yurei. I mean, my favorite are the ghosts. Those are those are what I really love. I just think that they are, um, I just think yurei stories are so fascinating. Well, let me let me ask you, do, do you have a yurei story that you can share with us? God. I, have, I mean, I have so many. I mean, they're just like, and you know, and part of the thing about Yurei too is that they are they are a hundred percent real, and that is one of the great parts of living in Japan and being in part of the culture is that there's no question that Yurei are not real, right? There's absolutely no question. One of my my own personal stories is when I decided that I wanted to propose marriage to my wife, she was like, well, okay, but in a traditional Japanese sense, you have to go and sort of, you know, you have to speak with my father about it before I'm going to agree to marry you because I have to hear what he has to say. Well, that was a bit of shock for me because her father has been dead for more than a decade and I've never even met him. But, you know, we did the full thing and I had to go to his grave and she waited aside and I went up, you know, and I made the presentation and spoke to him about it, you know, and everything. And when I, she was very nervous and worried about what her father was going to say because she was getting married to a foreigner and was going to have to leave Japan. And so like when she was done, she was like, so what did he say? You know, how did it go? And, um, you know, I still believe to this day that, that he gave me his blessing. And that's what yurei are. You know, they're they're a very vital part of the culture itself, more than just any particular. I mean, it, I do have my favorite stories as well. Like, I love Botan Doro. Botan Doro. If if you want to look at my classic yurei story, that's my favorite one. That's that's a young ghost woman who who never fell in love, and so she she wanders the streets one night and meets this old man um, who never got married either, and they. They fall in love, and it's all quite tragic and beautiful, which being more of the romantic nature, I like better than the horror ones. Yeah, and I, I think the West is fascinated with the horror, mm-hmm. and, and I think the more we experience this, I think the more people will fall in love with all aspects of yurei, of yokai, of you know the culture in mm-hmm. total. Yeah, I, I would agree with the the horror comments because you know we we are more familiar over here with the grudge mm-hmm. and the ring as opposed to the rest of the yurei. Yeah, um, totally. Yeah. And people will say that it's like, oh, yurei are so scary, and I'm like, well, no, they're not. I mean, sure, some are. I mean, some are completely you know, they're terrifying. You know, they really are the most terrifying folkloric creatures in all of Japan. But at the same time, they're not all scary. I mean, there's yeah. there's right. stories there of like a yurei wife who. Like a woman who died early, and then um, she felt bad because she didn't want to leave her husband all alone. So her ghost came back, or Yude came back, and didn't tell her husband that she was dead. And they had a child, and they raised the child until the child was, I think, three years old. And then when the child was self-sufficient and the husband was self-sufficient, she said, Hey, you know what? I hate to break it to you, but I actually died three years ago. So um, I'm done now. You know, I set out. I wanted to make sure that you were happy and that you had a child and all this stuff. So you actually have these yure that are giving live birth to children who then stay living and then like he will say like, well, that's crazy talk. And then he, of course, goes back and finds her grave, you know, far away somewhere and lots wow. of stories like that, that's, actually. Yeah, that's that's powerful. And and like you said, this is very real. This is a part of, of life. Yeah. This is not something separate. This is not a, a story in a book, but this is something that's being lived out in yeah, the culture. Yeah, and the yure are always there amongst you. And they're a vital part of the culture. I mean, I think that as well well as the yokai you know there's so many people like when japan first opened up to the west and you had this vanguard of people like writers who went over there like ab mitford wrote probably one of the first books that i know of that was attempt to explain japan to the western world and he wrote about yurei stories because he's like this is what japan's all about and lafcardio hearn another really great author who i deeply admire did the exact same thing because he felt that you know, in his book, Japan and Attempted Interpretation, he makes the point that if you don't understand Japan's relationship with its dead, you will never understand Japan. And without that vital key element, you're just getting a veneer. You're getting none of the depth. Yeah, that's that's very powerful. And, and it's, I think, important to note uh, in our discussion about Japanese culture. Stepping back just for a moment before we go into a couple of uh-huh. final questions with you, talk to us a little bit more about some of your other works. We talked about Yurei, the Japanese ghost. We talked about Wayward. 
You spoke a little bit of Kitaro, and if I'm not mistaken, you do translation for that. Do you also write yeah, for that? Yeah, Kitaro is, I'm super excited about that. So the first okay. volume came out as kind of a test volume because a lot of people just weren't too sure about how well people would receive it. You know, I mean, like literally for years, I've been knocking on doors trying to get someone to take a chance on it. And when I found out Drawn and Quarterly had the license, I was super excited and wrote them this big letter, you know, I'm like, hey, you don't know me, I don't know you, but I'm going to come work for your company, just so you know, you know, just as an FYI, when you've got the license for him, I'm coming along with it. I didn't give them that much choice in the matter. And I've slowly, you know, I've slowly built up a good trust with them, working together as partners over the years and the work we've done together. So with Kitaro, they're really, um, they really allowed me to get deeply into it. So it's all handpicked stories, you know, I curated the entire collection. We're doing seven volumes. And that, let me tell you, so this is my favorite Shigeru Mizuki story. It was um, it was a really tense moment because he is very, well, he was, I hate having to talk about him in the past tense now. Um, he was very, I don't know what the right word, he, he, he cared deeply about his reputation and his work. And he didn't really care if some other country translated his work or not. You know, it was, just, it was not interesting to him to say, oh, we can have your books in America. I mean, he needed no money. You know, he needed what he, what he needed was for his scholarship and his art to find a new audience. And so I found out that one of the reasons why he had not ever really been translated is because a lot of people didn't really know him or they just wanted to cherry pick his popular stuff or the easy hits, you know? So he actually, uh, he actually issued this challenge where he's like, you know, make a list of 50 of my stories that you would like to translate. And from that list, I will know if you know my work or not. And I put together, yeah, I put together my list and he accepted 49 of them. And I still think he crossed off one just because he couldn't <laughs> accept the list as is, but he's like, yeah, fine. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So, um, so these Kitaro stories are my hand picked and my curated list of stories that I wanted with his personal approval on it of what I think are just some of the best ones and then also every volume is going to come out I'm doing a seven part history of Kitaro that basically tells the story of the character so every volume is going to come out and because um, the stories aren't connected in Kitaro there's no continuity of there you know he just would write them very randomly so you don't necessarily need the volumes in order but I wanted to create something in there that would create a little value and want people to get the entire series so they'll have a seven volume increase Incremental history of Kitaro that comes out in each volume. Doing yokai files for those as well, and then we're also just doing some extra cool stuff. You know, some more bonus features in there. And well, if I translate the Very whole thing, so yeah. Nice. Very good. And anything beyond those three main publications that you'd like to highlight or, or for yeah, people to? Yeah, I mean, to... in just in general manga, I'm doing I'm doing um, I'm, I'm translating the Queen Emerelda series for Kodansha, which I'm really excited because Matsumoto Leiji was another guy. He did Star Blazers. So, you know, he was another really formative person in my life. And then um, a friend of mine, Mark Morris, and I, uh, we're actually taking our first stab at doing an original comic. So we're hopefully going to have that for Emerald City Comic Con. And it's um, it's pretty fun to work on, but it's basically the tale of these two Buddhist monks slash yokai hunters, one of which is a fox and one of which is a frog called Kitsu and Ibo. And we call our comic uh, The Narrow Road. So hopefully more of that as it comes out. I'm definitely looking at that. I had no idea about that before, and I'm definitely yeah, looking forward. Yeah, that's kind of it's official. I mean, we it's really we're just doing it on the on the <laughs> secret here. We're not sure what'll happen to it. You know, we're doing it for fun, basically more than anything else. So I'm not 100 percent sure where the where narrow road will lead, but yeah, definitely, and and much success to you and all of that. As we look around the world and as we talk about monsters, and specifically right now, we're we're speaking of yokai this month, devoting the entire month Which to it. Awesome. One of the things that we look for um, are life lessons cautionary tales, relevant wisdom, things like that. And and one thing that we've noticed about Japanese folklore is that, and we mentioned this with Matthew a couple of weeks ago, is that there's not always a reconciliatory aspect to Japanese tales. No, no, almost never, right? I mean, because <laughs> because what point does, in fact, it's so funny because there's um, there's this author called uh, Dazai Osamu, who is just, he's an incredible, one of Japan's great authors authors, you know, and he wrote this little book of folk tales, which was basically written during World War II, and it's about a father attempting to um, to distract his child because they're in the shelter, and they're being bombed, and so the father is attempting to sort of, like, 
calm his children by telling them some of these old folk stories, you know. And the son, at one point in time, he's like, well, Dad, what do these stories mean? And he's like, I don't know. It's a Japanese folk tale. It doesn't mean anything, you know. <laughs> and that's Same yeah, and that's true, and that's because of I mean, largely because of the origin and the Hyakumonogatari Kaidan Kai game, you know, which is if you're familiar, that is the old storytelling the game, right. you know. So people would would get around in a circle and they would they would light candles and they would take turns telling stories, and every time they told a story, they'd, they'd put out a candle, right? And so because of that, you have right. these stories that they were told for entertainment and they weren't told necessarily to lead a moral purpose. Although that said, there certainly are plenty many of Japanese folk tales that do have a very specific moral. Like uh, when I was in elementary school recently, I was talking about Urashima Taro and the Yuki Onna as well that tell these morals, which is basically don't break the rules, which is pretty important for Japanese society, actually. You know, they sort of reinforce the idea that society has certain rules. And if you obey them, you get a very happy, good life. And if you break the rules, right. um, disaster follows. Yeah. Well, and I think that was my next question. Even with the fun that is to be had with Japanese tales and, you know, just the open endedness of these stories, is there anything really that we could pull out to say this is relevant wisdom for everyday life these are life is there an overarching theme that you could eat and even with your yeah. is there an I mean, the overarching theme, theme and like you know like this goes back once again to shigeru mizuki um but his overarching theme is basically that there is wonder in the universe he used to say uh believe in things you cannot see because that that enriches your life the very act of mm. believing in something you know is important and so that's sort of that's also a role they serve right it's like food for the imagination you know classical japanese folklore is not big on explanation right like like one of one of the most classical ones where it's just weird is this woman comes over to her friend's house for tea and it's this lovely rich house and they're all very elegant and it's all very lovely and suddenly a giant dirty foot comes down from the ceiling and starts smashing and kicking over tables and so the <laughs> the woman of the house very you know summons the servants and they all clean the foot and the foot goes away and the friend's like what just happened and she you know it it just it just came you know they, that's what happened this house occasionally this big dirty foot comes in we got to clean it and if we don't clean it the foot gets angry and smashes over everything we just learned <laughs> and is there a reason for that i mean i I make this speculation in my book that I think a lot of it is because Japan as a country, as an island nation, is beset by natural disasters. I mean, just absolutely beset. It's almost as if the gods are slightly angry that anyone should live there. <laughs> and so their whole culture is built around the fact that at any given time, it can all just go away. Great thought. And I, I would love to live in Japan, but that is something that I've always um, <laughs> taken into consideration is I don't know if I actually want to live in One Japan. of my co workers when I was over there and like you know I think I had my first like I mean I, I don't know I'd had earthquakes in California but you know I had an earthquake in Japan and I was very cognizant of the typhoon and everything and my, my co-worker I'll never forget her advice because she's like she basically looked at me you know because I was worried about like oh, I'm a little, a little worried about earthquakes and she said don't worry in an earthquake if you die everyone dies there's nothing you can do about it you know, why worry about something that has, you know, you have absolutely no control about it. And if it happens, it happens. Zach, this has been an absolute pleasure to speak with you tonight. If I may, I, I want to give honor to your late mentor. Uh, and please forgive me if I mispronounce his name, Mizuki yes, Shigeru. Yeah, that's Am perfect. I that yeah, correct? absolutely. Just a few moments ago, you gave a quote from him, that overarching theme. Share with us those words once more as we close out this podcast and let this be an honor to him and his So he, uh, you know, he always said, believe in things you cannot see was one of one of his life lessons and he said that it was you know it was that that kept him alive in the islands of Rabul when he was fighting in a time that was just you know that was pure misery he found wonder in the concept of this this invisible world and it's something that he always cherished in his life and tried to teach to other people as well that the intangibles in life the things that you can't see are at the end of at the end the things that are far more important than something that you can hold in your hand it's absolutely beautiful, and, and I believe those are good words to live by and to bring this to a close. Ladies and gentlemen, Zach Davison. Zach, thank you so much again for your time tonight. Just invaluable information and fun yeah. that we've had speaking thank with you Thank you tonight. so much. Thank yeah. you for having me. 